Hi, I'm Maya Warren. And I'm Rich Arzell. And we are co-authors on the manuscript dealing with structural, compositional, and sensorial properties of United States commercial ice cream products. So the research that we wanted to do within this, this manuscript was to look at a survey, literally, of um, what's out there on the commercial market, um, mostly looking at the Wisconsin area because that's where we are um, located, but what's out there on the commercial market in terms of ice cream products. And when we say ice cream products, we're looking not only at the traditional ice cream, so 10% milk fat or more, we're also looking at low-fat, reduced-fat, or even non-fat ice cream products. Do the low-fat products mimic full-fat products in any way, shape, or form? Are there general relationships? As well as do the microstructure components, so the compositional and the structural components, how do they relate to sensorial properties of those ice cream products? Yeah, basically we went to the grocery store and bought everything they had and then <laughs> analyzed it with everything we could. We were really interested in, in uh, what the range of composition and structures that we saw out in the market. So uh, it's actually turned out pretty interesting because there's some that that, uh, that are very different from the others and both structure and sensory properties and what we got to look at was that whole range of what's out there. We surveyed roughly 18 different commercial ice cream products and in that we had non-fat ice cream products, low-fat slash reduced fat products as well as your traditional ice cream products and in that um, for instance the fat range all the way from like 0.5 percent fat and like the non-fat products all the way up to like roughly 15 percent fat um, in your full fat full fat products um, and we analyzed them in many different ways like I said we put every different thing that we could possibly so we measure air air cell size, we measured ice crystal size, we measured overrun, we measured the fat globules and whether they were individual fat globules or clusters of fat globules. Uh, we measured the meltdown rate of the ice cream uh, and then we measured the sensory attributes of the okay. ice cream. And in the sensory attributes we looked at creaminess, greasiness, the size of the, of the ice particulate, so maybe how icy that product may be um, sensed by the human, the human subject, um, as well as the denseness and the, and the breakdown in creaminess and greasiness of the product. So we were looking specifically for correlations that uh, that we expected to find. So the size of the ice crystals probably would correlate with uh, how coarse and icy it was. We expected that uh, the size and amount of big clusters of fat globules would influence its meltdown rates and, and things like that. In addition to that, some of the other findings were that, you know, we look at how ice cream melts at ambient temperature, and we also did like the melt rate of the ice cream in the in the mouth. And those two actually have no uh, relationship. There isn't a correlation between um, how it melts in the mouth and how it melts at ambient temperatures. And so that's actually a pretty interesting finding. And maybe maybe our melt test isn't the best way to sort of predict how it's going to behave or melt in the mouth. But we think it'll predict how it melts off the cone and right. into your hands. Yeah. So that's sort of maybe some future work <laughs> that we can we can look at. Um, relating it to how it melts on a cone. Other findings were that, you know, the amount of partially partially coalesced fat, so the amount of the agglomerated fat globules, um, as well as the amount of total fat related to how creamy the product is perceived by the panelists. So when people are out there buying ice cream, they really want it to be creamy, they're looking for, usually they're looking for ice creams that have, you know, a good amount of partially coalesced fat. So. And we measure meltdown rates by putting the ice cream, a slab of ice cream onto a screen at room temperature ambient temperature and allow it to melt through and what's interesting I think was that some products they just melt and dripped right through and other products collapsed a little bit but left a, uh, a remnant foam on top of the screen all the ice was melted uh, but there was a disc of ice cream like material left on the on the screen but that's one of the I think one of the most important findings that we that we got was that some ice creams just melt right through the screen and other ice creams stand up against the weight of gravity uh, and what she's working on is trying to relate that to the structures that we're analyzing in the ice cream I, I think the, that the study will will really generate knowledge among those that don't work on it but also provide insights to those that uh, that that do. From a consumer standpoint, we, one of the arguments that we make about why this is important is that, well, if we can control how, for example, how the fat clusters uh, operate in ice cream and control how we make them when we make the ice cream, then maybe we can make ice creams with lower fat or lower saturated fat, hopefully a little bit better for people. So ice cream is probably the most complicated food there is. Mm -hmm. 
It's got a foam phase, it's got an emulsion phase, it's got a dispersion phase of ice crystals, and then you can even count the micellar casing mm -hmm. in, in there as well. And, uh, and then what holds it all together is an unfrozen water phase that contains all the dissolved sugars and, and, uh, uh, and proteins and milk solids and things like that. Uh, so it's, it's a very complicated material, and what we're trying to do is understand how those structures inter interrelate to uh, better understand its physical properties and its sensory properties.